More often than not, when we visit an amusement park, we want to ride as many attractions as possible. Coaster enthusiasts in particular often prioritize riding all the coaster credits at a specific park no matter how big or small they are. But not all credits are just as easy to get. Some credits have been a royal pain for me to ride. In this video, I will talk about 8 scenarios that have made it challenging for me to obtain certain coaster credits throughout the years and the stories around them. The 8 scenarios I plan to cover are limited operating schedules for a park, transportation troubles, minimum rider limits, a specific track and a multi-track coaster being closed, not fitting on a ride, being banned from a kiddie coaster, weather, and mechanical issues. Let's start with the limited schedule. There's one park in Ohio that's notoriously hard to get the credits at, and that is Stricker's Grove. This park is only open three or four days a year, and that made it hard for me to get the two Woodies here in Tornado and Teddy Bear. But eventually I was able to hit it on Labor Day weekend in 2018, and I'm glad I got on Tornado. It had a good pop of air time on a drop towards the end of the ride. Another park with a really limited operating schedule is the Washington State Fair. This park has a classic wooden roller coaster that I've been eyeing for a really long time but this fair only occurs in the spring and then around Labor Day. Fortunately, I was out in Washington for work around Labor Day, so I was able to get this credit, and it was a lot of fun with some good pops of airtime. Another really hard one for me to get were the two steel coasters that John Ivers used to have on his farm in Blue Flash and Blue 2. These are two homemade roller coasters, and you couldn't just show up at John's property. You have to respect his privacy. So how did I get to ride these? I looked up John's address online and I sent him a handwritten note and mailed it to him. I wasn't sure if I'd get a reply, but eventually he did respond to me and I set up a time to ride right before Hollywood Nights in 2019. These were really fun coasters and it was cool to talk to John to learn how he designed them. And I'm glad I did this in 2019 because these stopped running at John's farm in 2020. These were relocated to a haunt in Ohio. Now moving on to transportation, I've had some issues getting to a few parks. The first was Ober Gatlinburg for the Ski Mountain Coaster. The first time I visited Pigeon Forge, I was with a tour group and we had limited time to go through Gatlinburg. To get to Gatlinburg, I actually had to take a trolley from Pigeon Forge to Gatlinburg. And by the time we got to Ober Gatlinburg and realized we had to take that tram up the hill to ride the coaster, we realized we wouldn't have made the trolley back to Pigeon Forge to get on our tour bus, so I had to skip that credit. So I came back a year later on a family vacation, and that time I gave myself plenty of time to go up the mountain and ride that mountain coaster. It was bumpier than any other mountain coaster I've been on, but it had a really cool setting. Another challenging one for me was the Giant Dipper Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. When I was out in California for an internship, I did not have a car. So I was using public transit to get to every single park. I was able to get to most of them, but one of the ones I couldn't get to was Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. I got extremely lucky. My roommate was an avid biker and he was going on a bike ride in Santa Cruz. So I tagged along with him in his car where he was going to start his bike ride and had a few hours at this park before he was done with his route. Wildfire at Colmarden was another tricky one for me to get. When I was in Sweden, I was only using public transit. So I originally was planning to go from Stockholm to Gothenburg to go to Liseberg. But I realized there was a way to get to Colmarden with public transit. I had to get up at 5 a.m. to do it, take a train and two buses, but I was able to get to the park. There was a catch though, I only had two hours to do everything in that park, and I lost an hour walking to the very back of the park, and then again to the front, because Colmarn is so huge. But it was well worth it for an hour of rides in Wildfire, because it's one of my favorite coasters. Moving on to minimum rider limits, this is a thorn in your side if you're visiting a park alone. The best example of this was Jetstar 2 at Lagoon. Because of the way the restraints were set up, it's a belt that goes around two riders, single riders were not allowed, and it complicates finding a partner in this ride because you're literally sitting in someone's lap. I was able to find another coaster enthusiast though, and I shared the ride with them, and we were both glad we got the credit, but it was a one and done for both of us. Another really hard one for me to get was Texas Tornado at Wonderland. If you're not familiar with this park, they have very limited hours. Most weekdays, they're only open for three hours, from seven to 10. And what complicates things with Texas Tornado is that it has a minimum rider limit. So if you go on one of those weekdays, there might not be enough people in the park to even run this ride. I've heard of enthusiasts having that problem. So I intentionally visited this park on a busy weekend day so I could ride Texas Tornado on my heart's content. And I'm glad I did because this ride had a lot of deceptive positive G's on it. Another hard one for me to get was Tornado at Parque de Atracciones de Madrid. 
This is a rare Intamin Invert. This one required a full train to run, and it couldn't have even 23 riders. It had to have exactly 24 riders. The park was not too busy, and I was in a time crunch because I was trying to do both parks in Madrid before taking off for a flight back home, but eventually enough people came over and I was able to get one lap on this coaster. The last one that was a big challenge for me was Scandia Screamer at Scandia, Ontario. This one required a full train just like Tornado, but this was even harder because I don't think there was enough people in the entire park on a Sunday night. Fortunately, a rather large family showed up and they all came over to Scandia Screamer and we filled that train so I got my rides in this coaster. And this miler gave some great airtime. And I'm really glad I got on this ride because the park closed just a few months after my visit. Another scenario that makes it hard to get all the credits is if a ride runs multiple tracks. Parks don't like to run all the sides unless capacity requires it. One of the hard ones for me to get was Steeplechase at Blackpool Pleasure Beach, specifically the right side. When I got to the park in the morning, they were running the left and center side. But later in the day, the center side had a mechanical issue, so they actually opened up the right side for a very short period of time, and I was able to get on it before they shut it back down. Superman Escape from Krypton, specifically the right side at Six Flags Magic Mountain, took me four visits to actually get on. In my first three visits, the right side was closed. In my first two visits, only the left side was open. In my third visit, it was during holiday in the park when Superman tends to be closed. While it was no different than the left side, it was great to get back on Superman because I love how long and drawn out that launch is. Another scenario that occurs is not fitting on an attraction. Now I'm 5'9", 160 pounds, so usually I don't have too much issues with this. But there were two rides that gave me a lot of trouble. The first was Timberline Twister at Knott's Berry Farm. I think I was technically above the maximum height requirement, but the operator said I could ride as long as I fit in the train. Well, there wasn't much legroom and I struggled to get that lap bar down. But I was able to ride it, and honestly, it had some good airtime for a kiddie coaster. The other challenging one for me was Dragon Wagon at Sandy Lake Amusement Park. Typically, Dragon Wagons are off limits for adults, but Sandy Lake didn't care. However, I had to really contort myself to fit in the vehicle. I think I only had one butt cheek on the seat, but they let me ride like that. Another scenario is if an adult is banned from a kiddie coaster, unless you have a child, or if adults are banned outright on a kiddie ride. The first one I had this issue with was Ravine Flyer 3 at Waldemere. In general, adults are not allowed in this ride unless they have a child. However, because I visited on a day when there are about 10 to 15 people in the park as a whole, the operator allowed me to ride. He said the intention was that kids could ride it without an adult stealing their seat. So we had no problem with you riding because there was no line. Another one I had an issue getting was the Great Chase San Perla coaster at Six Flags America. In my first visit, the operator saw me get in line and just shook her head and told me to get out of line. In my recent visit last year, I got in line and no one said anything and I was able to get this credit. It wasn't a particularly good kitty coaster, but I'm glad I finally got on it. The last one is sort of a sad story. It was the Orient Express operated by Rockwell Amusements. I went to a carnival in Seekonk, Massachusetts, and the carny denied me. I was the only one getting on the ride, and he just shook his head and said this is for kids and laughed at me. Later that summer, I went to a different Rockwell Amusements carnival, the Washington County Fair. I was primarily there for the big coaster that Rockwell had, but I noticed the same Orient Express was there, and because I actually had a line this time, I was able to get on it without any issues. The other scenario that can cause a lot of issues is bad weather. When I was at Heidi Park, Desert Race was hard to ride. I was at Heidi Park on a day where it absolutely poured. There were only breaks in the rain for maybe 15 or 20 minutes at a time. And Desert Race is an intimate accelerator, so it could not run in any form of rain. So whenever it stopped raining, I had to run over to this ride to try to get on it before it shut down again. And I'm glad I got on it. It had a forceful launch and some good airtime. Arkansas Twister and Magic Springs was another problematic one. The ride opened late due to its location behind the water park, and this was a park I didn't want to visit many times. But after the first hour when the ride was supposed to open, thunderstorms rolled in. I have to give the park a lot of credit for waiting out the two to three hours of storms and staying open even though it still poured the rest of the day. Arkansas Twister was a mediocre wooden coaster, but I did have a good laugh on it because of how long and drawn out that hill is on the return run. Another hard one for me to get was Colorado Adventure at Fantasia Land. This was another visit where I had heavy rain all day. Fantasia Land will run everything else in heavy rain, but Colorado Adventure has some issues. 
they were only able to run one train and they had to front load it and there was no guarantee would be able to ride. But I was able to get one ride on it before it shut down for the day. Blue Streak at Connie Lake Park was another tricky one. This park was closed due to bankruptcy a few times when I passed this park and I originally was going to hit it on a 2017 road trip. But it poured the day I was going to go there and the park didn't even bother opening. So in 2019 when I was going to Niagara Falls, I made a detour to hit Connie Lake Park because it was actually open. And I'm glad I got there after Connie was closed for 2020. Blue Streak was really rough, but it had some awesome airtime in the back row on the outward leg. Top Thrill Dragster at Cedar Point was another hard one for me to get. I think enthusiasts have had this issue a lot when you go here. It was closed due to wind for me. This happened during my first day at Cedar Point, but on the second day, it opened very shortly and kept closing due to mechanical issues, so I'm glad I got at least one lap on it. Pyrenees at Parque España was a really hard one to get. This was closed during the day due to rain. The trip organizer had to plead to get it open for us for ERT, and the park would open it for us if we agreed to one thing, if we didn't mind getting covered in grease. And no one complained because of how forceful and fun this invert was. The other hard ones for me to get were Flying Dinosaur and Hollywood Dream at Universal Studios Japan. Right before I visited this park for the first time, there was a magnitude 6.2 earthquake, and the epicenter was right in Osaka. I was honestly shocked the park even opened that day. But understandably, both those rides were closed. The next day, those two rides were still closed because they were awaiting an inspection. We originally weren't planning to have a third day at Universal, but we were able to squeeze it in before we left so we could get multiple laps in these B&Ms. And thankfully, the park wasn't too crowded, and if you know anything about Universal Studios Japan, you know this park can usually get swarmed. The last category is mechanical issues. When I made a return trip to Six Flags Discovery Kingdom, I only needed to get on Joker and Harley Quinn Crazy Coaster. I figured two hours would be enough time because I had my Diamond Elite skip the line passes that I figured I could use in these rides. Well, I ran into an issue. The park wouldn't allow me to get them for any coaster at the park that runs just one train. And if you know anything about Six Flags Discovery Kingdom, you know pretty much every coaster in this park runs one train, and Joker, of course, while it can run two, was only on one train the day I was there. And to add salt to the wound, both these rides were closed when I got there. So I was a bit nervous I'd even be able to get on both these rides, but fortunately they did open in the last hour. Harley Quinn was a walk-on, and while Joker was a 40 minute wait, I was able to get a few rides on it. Especially because the operators allowed the last train of the day to get two laps. Another ride I had a lot of issues with was the Boomerang at Worlds of Fun. This ride was closed most of the day. I did notice it testing towards the end of the day, so I ran over to it. I was able to get on it, and about two trains later it broke down again for the day and it was actually closed in my most recent visit in 2020. Damon and at Tivoli Gardens was another tough one. I had to wait about a half hour for it, and right when I was about to board, it broke down. They cleared out the queue line, and it didn't reopen until night. The tricky thing here is I had to catch a train across the street. I cut very close at my train, but I was able to get two laps in this coaster, and just barely make my train. It was a fun floorless coaster that reminded me of Great Bear at Hershey Park, with the elevated helix at the start, and the forceful inversions. Lightning Run at Kentucky Kingdom was another hard one. We were supposed to have morning ERT on this Chance Morgan Hyper GTX coaster, but the ride was having a chain lift issue, so we got T3 instead. Right before our bus left, the organizer was able to arrange a special ride with the park where we went up the exit and got one lap on this ride, and I loved how powerful the airtime was. Cornball Express at Indiana Beach was a big problem for me on my first visit. I showed up in the middle of the afternoon and Cornball Express was closed. I saw no activity on the ride platform, so I was skeptical it would even open. When I was in line for Hoosier Hurricane, I saw the ride send out a test train, so I booked it over to Cornball Express. And I'm glad I did because the ride was only open for maybe 20 or 30 minutes. I got two awesome rides on this coaster, getting some powerful airtime. When I went back for my third ride, a piece of the train started to rattle and maintenance shut it down for the rest of the day. Diamondback at Frontier City was another issue for me. In my first ever visit to this park, it was closed, and I know that's something a lot of people find when they go to this park. In my second visit to the park, it was during holiday in the park, and I was skeptical to even run the rides because it was supposed to be in the high 30s, but the temperature kept creeping up and got closer to 50 degrees, so everything at this park was open, including Diamondback. It was closed half the day due to some mechanical issues, but when it was open, I was riding this Aero Shuttle Loop and appreciating how powerful that airtime was. Alpine Bobsled at Great Escape 
was another one that thwarted me in my first visit to that park. I was a young kid looking forward to riding it, but the bobsled was stuck on the lift hill. We returned the next day and I got an alpine bobsled once before it broke down again. And it's really hard for me to get on this ride even though I visit Great Escape almost every year. It has been closed in almost every single visit and when it is open it closes early due to noise issues. Shredder at Nickelodeon Universe was closed in my first ever visit to the park. When I returned a year later, Shredder kept having mechanical issues. I was able to get on after an early breakdown, and oddly enough, I was actually evacuated from the brake run because it couldn't return to the station. It ran much better on my most recent visit though. Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure at Islands of Adventure is one that gave a lot of people issues in its first year. I had to wait in line for three hours, two of which was spent waiting through a breakdown. Eventually, Universal cleared out the line, and as we were cleared out, I noticed the ride was testing. So we hung around the ride, and they reopened it about 15 minutes later, and I ran on this coaster. And it was my favorite ride in Florida. I loved the theming, and it was just a fun ride start to finish. Joker at Six Flags Great Adventure was another one that was much harder for me to get than I expected. In my first three visits to the park after it opened, it was closed. The following year, I had a road trip on the Jersey Shore to hit a bunch of new parks, but I made a pit stop at Six Flags Great Adventure specifically for this ride, and a few extra rides in El Toro, and thankfully Joker was open, so I was able to get on this free spin. Last but not least, I need to talk about Lightning Rod Dollywood. In my first ever visit to the park in 2016, Lightning Rod was closed, and it opened a week later. In June of 2017, I had a week-long family vacation, I saw Lightning Rod test, but it never opened. Yet again, it opened a week later. When I saw the ride was running reliably later that summer, I went down for a weekend trip in July of 2017. But Lightning Rod was closed for that weekend I was there. It reopened the following week yet again. So I planned to go down for Smoky Mountain Christmas and a huge snowstorm hit and I was worried the ride wouldn't open again. Another thing that complicated things was that I tore my ankle playing Ultimate Frisbee and I could barely walk. And Dollywood was out of wheelchairs the day I was supposed to go to the park. But when I saw Lightning Rod was going to run, I just took a bunch of Advils, limped through the park, and got on Lightning Rod, and it has been my favorite coaster ever since. I had much better luck with the ride in subsequent visits, although on my most recent one, the ride was closed, and now we know it's being retracked partially as steel. I also had two other scenarios that were really unique ones that didn't fit into any of the other categories. The first was Wood Express at Park St. Paul. I only had about an hour and a half at this park before I had to leave to catch my flight back home to the US, so I specifically contacted the park asking if this ride would open with the park. They said yes. Well I showed up and it opened late, and when it did open, another enthusiast group had about a half hour of ERT in the ride. So I only had about a half hour to get on this ride. I only got two laps in this coaster, but it was a lot of fun. It was probably my second favorite of the smaller gravity group coasters. This ride was action packed with airtime start to finish. Last but not least, I want to talk about Wonder Woman Golden Lasso Coaster at Six Flags Fiesta, Texas. In this ride's opening year, it was originally supposed to open in March, but the opening was postponed to April. And I was going to be in San Antonio for work in April. And when the ride was going to open the weekend I was there, I was ecstatic. But there was a problem. It was for members only. And I had a season pass. So my plan was to upgrade to a membership. However, I wanted one for my home park in Six Flags, New England. But between the date the announcement was made, and the date I'd have to leave for my trip, Six Flags New England was not going to reopen. So I wasn't sure if I'd be able to get on it. I called Fiesta Texas and they said I could purchase one for Six Flags New England, and I could show them my email receipt and they'd let me on the ride. Well I showed up to do that, and Wonder Woman was closed due to mechanical issues. The ride reopened later that night, and I tried to go over and ride it, but the pathway was blocked by the Mardi Gras parade. I watched that rather irritated just because I heard that RMC roar in the background and wanted to get on it. And once the parade stopped, I booked it right over there, got in Wonder Woman, and loved the ride. So those are some of the hardest coaster credits for me to ever get on. I know this is a bit of a different video, but I thought it'd be a fun one to talk about. What are some of the hardest credits that you've ever gotten? I would love to hear down in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate it if you gave it a like, and you considered subscribing because there'll be a lot more roller coaster and amusement park videos here at Canopy Coaster. Thanks for watching.